It's good to be with you yet again, um, and, and we're reflecting today on the readings for the 16th Sunday of the year, and really the Lord is particularly, the Word of God is particularly talking to people like myself, who have been appointed as shepherds, uh, and there are some very strong words to the shepherds. Anyway, we'll get to that a little later on, because I think we need to take those words very seriously. Um, and as the theme is very much uh, shepherd, um, uh, how, how all of us are called to be shepherds, and we see in the gospel how Jesus also shepherds the shepherds, because he has sent the apostles on their first um, evangelizing mission. Send, he had sent them off in pairs to go to the towns and villages that he was to visit. And he had given them authority, as we heard last week, he given them authority, authority to heal, authority to challenge evil, authority to proclaim and build the kingdom of God. He shared his own authority with them. He shares his authority with us. But we can only exercise that authority if we are truly servants, if we are seeking to be caring and compassionate shepherds, pastors. Now, these words are not just for those who are so ordained um, to the priesthood because all of us are called to be shepherds. The whole church is called to be a shepherd community in the world around us. And each one of us are called to be shepherds. I remember there was some years ago when I was in, in, um, in South Bristol, um, in, a, in my previous parish, and the priest next door uh, had become very ill and had to be withdrawn, and uh, I had and I, I looked after his parish, as well as my own, for about eight months. And the first Sunday I went there, I got up in my sermon and I said, "I guess you're all feeling like sheep without a shepherd, and a bit bereft." So I can understand you feeling bereft, but you know you're not sheep without a shepherd. First of all, the shepherd Christ is among you, is with you. But more than that, he's calling you to be shepherds to each other. Calling you to be shepherds to each other. Every one of us has the call to be a shepherd. So let's explore this theme of being a shepherd for a moment. As the prophet um, Jeremiah speaks of doom to the shepherds, God's word challenging those who've been given authority and responsibility but are not exercising it. Well, very sadly, we've experienced that in the church too, haven't we, in recent times, maybe in every period of the church's history in different ways. But the utter, utter scandals of, of abuse that's ha happened at the hands of uh, of those who have been entrusted with pastoral ministry or at the hands of those who have lived, are supposed to be living vowed religious life. And that's appalling. And the things we've heard, for instance, um, from Canada about the treatment of indigenous people, the First Nations children in Canada, the treatment of of orphans and the poor and unmarried mothers and their babies in some of the homes in Ireland. It's a, it is an inhumanity that is a total countersign to what we call to be as a shepherd community. And particularly those of us 
who have been given authority and responsibility. But as I said, all of us, by our baptism and our confirmation, are called and gifted to be shepherds to each other. Parents, you are shepherds to your children. Husband, you're shepherd to your wife. Wife, you're shepherd to your husband. We're shepherds to our parents, particularly our elderly parents as they grow older. And uh, in just a couple of weeks time, we'll be celebrating the first ever uh, World Day for grandparents and the elderly. We are called, all of us are called to bring the compassion, the care, the listening heart of Christ to each other, to serve each other. Let's look at this image of the shepherd for a moment that we find in the first reading and in the psalm. Uh, and we also is reflected in the gospel as Jesus wanting to shepherd his apostles when they land in a quiet place to have a bit of a debrief, a bit of a rest, nice meal, a bit of peace after all the strain and stress of ministry. I know what that feels like. <laughs> and what happens? They're confronted with a great crowd. What does Jesus do? He says, they're the ones who are important, not us. We need to go and serve them. And he teaches the apostles, he teaches the church in this gospel that the, the need of humanity must always come first. We need, we need to find our resources to sustain us. And yes, we all need quiet time. We need debriefing time. We need just to rest a while. But we also need to respond to human need and be prepared to let go of our own needs in order to reach out to others. And that's the real message of the gospel today. As, as he stepped to shore, he saw a large crowd and he took pity on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he set himself to teach them at some length. The, the biblical shepherd is very unlike shepherds today. The biblical shepherd had a close relationship with e each member of, his of the flock. Um, they would normally be at night, they would be penned up, the shepherd would lead his, he didn't drive his sheep, you know, they didn't have quad bikes. They didn't have snapping dogs either. They instead, the shepherd knew each one of his sheep, had names for them, would sing, maybe sing psalms, call to them, talk with them. As he led them, he went ahead of them. Ahead of them so as to encounter any predator or anything that would harm the sheep, to guide them to the good pastures. So he would lead. He wouldn't send dogs to snap them and to bark them into the right direction. He would lead gently, quietly, compassionately. That's the model for the kind of shepherding we need in the church that you have a right to expect from your priests that they're prepared to lead and understand their flock when they find it difficult to follow. Pope Francis has this wonderful phrase, doesn't he? Uh, telling, talking to us priests that we must smell of the sheep, smell of the flock. You won't smell of the flock unless you're close to them unless you listen, unless you're part of their lives and their struggles, 
their hopes and their disappointments, that you uh, seek to, to walk alongside. So that's, that's the biblical model of shepherd. And when Jesus in his passage about the good shepherd in John six uh, in J in John's gospel, which we're not part of our gospel today, but in that passage, when he took, describes himself as the good shepherd, he speaks about laying down his life for his sheep. What that's actually referring to is that um, the shepherds would have relatively small flocks that they knew by name, each one they knew their own, and they would go into a communal pen at night. And they were taken in turns to lay down in the gap. It would be a kind of a thicket type hedge to keep predators out. But of course, there was a gap in the middle to get the sheep in, to get the sheep out. And the shepherd would lay down in that gap so that any predator, whether it be a human thief, whether it be a wolf or a lion, because of course there were lions in the Middle East at the time of Jesus, they they would, the shepherd would have to confront them. So it was risky. They would lay down their lives for their sheep. And that's exactly what our shepherd, Jesus, has done. Literally lay down his life upon the cross for us. To bring us the fullness of life. To lead us into new pastures. So that's the biblical model of shepherd. And it's a challenge to all of us to be shepherds to each other, to really care, to listen, to understand the heartbeat of the other, not to, not to give um, um, trite phrases and hackneyed words, but to listen and listen below the words, listen to the heart of the other, and then stand alongside. The shepherd is one who binds up the, sh the wounds of the, of the sheep. That's why the healing ministry in the church is so important. Nourishing them in their hungers, whether it's hunger for the word of God, hunger for the richness of our Christian tradition or the hunger of an empty stomach, the hunger that comes from poverty. We are called to respond to every form of human hunger to nourish the flock, to guide and to lead. Shepherds need to have a vision, a vision of where God is leading. There's a, there's a psalm that says, unless the Lord builds the house, in labor to the builder, in vain do the builders labor. Uh, in vain is your keeping awake at night if the Lord is not the watchman. So we are called We are called to really listen. As a shepherd, you're called to listen with both ears. One ear to the cries of the flock. The other ear to the voice of the Spirit. Guiding and leading. That's very true. That's expressed especially, I think, in when you're praying healing with people. <clears throat> you, need, you need, first of all, to listen carefully to what the person coming before you is seeking. Then you need also to listen to what is the prayer the Spirit wants you to pray. How does the Spirit want you to pray for this person? So using both ears to listen to humanity, to listen to God, and to put those two together, and to have a vision when shepherds have responsibility for the whole flock, both to each to individuals, but also to the flock as a whole. And sometimes, um, 
sometimes the flock don't necessarily understand why the shepherd is leading them where he is or she is. <laughs> but hopefully they can have trust in the vision that you have. There's a phrase in the, in the book of Proverbs, without a vision, the people perish. Too many of our parishes are just reactive or they just perpetuate old habits. They don't, they don't seek the vision that the Holy Spirit is wanting to unfold if for their particular parish. Sometimes we're afraid of new innovations. I, I just wonder what New Testament they're reading if they're afraid of new innovations, because it's full of new innovations. Read the Acts of the Apostles. They're forever breaking into new ground, new territory, going into the unfamiliar. But always with the vision of the kingdom. And the kingdom is not the church. The kingdom is a transformed world. That's the kingdom of God, a world transformed. And the church is the shepherd servant that seeks to help humanity fashion something more like the kingdom, the world that God wants. The second reading today is also, that we're reflecting on today, is also very special, I think. You that used to be so far apart from us have been bought, brought very close by the blood of Christ. You who have been far from us. Just think, who, who have we kept far away? Who have we not welcomed? Who have we thought have no right to be in the church, no right to gather around the table to be fed by the Eucharist? How dare we think in those terms? How dare we think that Christ would not feed the crowds? He didn't ask them about their faith. He didn't ask them about whether they got all their relationships right. He didn't ask them about their gender or sexuality or whatever he just nurtured he healed he fed he gave hope and above all he had this huge hospitality of heart that welcomed them into his heart that's why the image of the sacred heart and devotion to sacred heart i think is a a, a wonderful devotion and particularly that little prayer I learned as a child, a sacred heart of Jesus, make my heart like unto thine. And that prayer has meant more and more to me as I've grown older. A sacred heart of Jesus, make my heart like unto thine. It touches the very heart of discipleship. It touches the very heart of shepherding. It touches the very heart of discipleship. It touches the very heart of mission, of compassion, of the kind of world we're to build. Long words from the prophet Jeremiah. Interesting, Pope Francis is not afraid to speak strong words, particularly to those who have been given authority, who have been given uh, ordained ministry to those who have been given much much is expected back says the Lord can I can I say something to you that I think is really important the way often the, stru the church is structured there is in theory great accountability. In practice, there is often very little. The people of God have a right to expect things from those ordained to ministry, to serve them. 
do not collude with bad practice. St. Paul says, speak your truth in love. It's important to speak your truth in love, but it's equally important to speak your truth. Don't be afraid to challenge bad practice. Because we are contributing to the decline of the church when we don't. We need to do it lovingly. We just need to look at what's happened to the church in Ireland. Because abuse, excessive power of the clergy, which then led to horrendous abuse, which has now in turn led to a loss of credibility in the church. A, a country that was so staunch in its faith. And we are responsible for that because of the poor shepherding, the oppressive shepherding, and often the abusive shepherding. So I think my time is up. <laughs> so I'll, we'll finish there. And I'm just going to ask you to recognize that you too are shepherds to others. We are entering the era when in fact the only fulfillment of ordained ministry is the empowering of those ministries that come from baptism and confirmation. The church will not survive into the 21st century if we do not expand and develop lay ministry. But Francis has given us a clue of that in establishing catechist as a formal ministry of the church. And I think he's going to do more than that. And this two year synod, global synod, there you must speak out your voice there you must seek to build a church fit for the 21st century. We need to think what kind of ministry, what kind of ordained ministry, what patterns and models of ordained ministry do we need for the 21st century, which may be diff very different from the 20th and 19th and earlier centuries. Don't be afraid to have vision, to innovate, and to speak your vision, particularly during the Synod, that is going to begin in October. Share your vision, for without a vision, the people perish. So thank you. Pray for those who are your shepherds. Pray that you, in the way God wants you to be, will also be a shepherd to others and pray for those who have been hurt by poor shepherding and pastoring in the life of the church. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your mind and heart in the knowledge and love of our Saviour Jesus Christ and the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit come down upon you all and remain with you always. And please pray for me. Thank you. And see you next week. <laughs>